Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with another nonfiction November video where I am recommending you nonfiction books that are all about my favorite historical figures. And so today I thought we would talk about Mary Shelley. And I feel like, again, if you have been around on my channel for any length of time, it won't come as a shock to you that I absolutely love Mary Shelley. She has been a major component of my channel basically, I think, since 2020. But 2020 was really the year of Mary for me. And so I went down the rabbit hole and I read a bunch of nonfiction about her. Mary Shelley is probably one of the figures that I will talk about this month that really needs no introduction. I think Mary Shelley has a lot of name recognition nowadays. Uh, she is most known for, of course, writing Frankenstein in 1818 as a teenage girl. But she did so much more than that. She was an incredible author. She wrote several more novels, and she was also involved with a group of people we call the Romantics. She herself was part of the Romantic movement, but she ran in a circle of the Romantic poets. She was married to Percy Shelley and was good friends with Lord Byron. Her parents were also authors and were really famous in their own right. So Mary Shelley is really an interesting case in that she herself is really dynamic and interesting, but she is also surrounded by so many really fascinating figures in their own right. Everybody that she ran with could get an 800 page biography and it still wouldn't be enough for me. I just in general like the time period in which she was living, but I think that makes it difficult, especially for nonfiction writers, because they often don't really want to settle totally on her. There are so many things that you can talk about in conjunction with her that she kind of came into contact with. And there are so many instances in her life that people view as more important than others. So that's kind of a stumbling block with nonfiction in terms of Mary Shelley, to me anyway. A lot of the time, Mary Shelley is not the main focus. And if she is, so many times historians decide to hone in on a particular time in her life and nine times out of 10, maybe even 10 times out of 10, that is the period of her life when she was writing Frankenstein. That's frustrating on many levels for me because she did so much more than Frankenstein and her life post Frankenstein was just as interesting as her life pre Frankenstein. But given that that is the thing she is the most known for, I think it's kind of obvious and understandable that historians would hone in on that one. And that's not just an issue with nonfiction. I have noticed that a lot of historical fiction or retellings of Mary's life, they always focus in on the period of time in which she was writing Frankenstein. And again, I think it's understandable because Frankenstein was such a revolutionary novel and it basically started the genre of sci-fi. So we can credit sci-fi to the mind of a teenage girl, which is just absolutely incredible to me. But I love Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley is maybe my second favorite historical figure. Her story is so emotional, it is so impactful, it's just so passionate to me. Her life in general, she experienced a lot of hardship, which I think is hard to read about, but I also think is relatable. I have never felt more for a historical figure than I have felt for Mary Shelley. To me, she is real in a way that a lot of times subjects of historical research are not. They seem at a distance from you. Mary Shelley could walk off the page and shake your hand to me. She is so vibrant and real. And a lot of that is because she was living during a time where writing was really, really big. So she wrote letters, she wrote journals, and everyone around her also did the same thing. So this is just one of those periods of history that's actually incredibly well documented. And so some of the other people that I may talk about this month, you may say, we don't know too much about them personally for sure. Richard III is one of those. Mary is somebody that we know quite a bit about, and I think that allows you to have a more personal relationship with her than some of the other historical figures. And it just in general marks this out as a really special time period, in my opinion. So I thought I would start this video with some primary sources, things that were written at the time, and in fact, things that she wrote. You can read a lot of Mary's own writing, and in fact, in some ways, you can say some of her fiction writing skews a little bit nonfiction as well, because she's putting a lot of herself in there and also her friendships with other people. The Last Man, one of her other sci-fi novels, a kind of dystopian end of the world type novel set in the future, 
very much is about Percy Shelley and Lord Byron after their deaths. Matilda, which is about a girl having a relationship with her father, uh, is very much about the relationship that Mary had with her own father, though that was not incestuous, but it's very much about the dynamic that she had with her own father. So there's something autobiographical about a lot of her fiction writing, but she also kept journals. This is my prized possession here. This is a collection of all of her journals. And one thing I'll say about this, I think you're gonna go into this thinking, oh, I'm gonna get a whole bunch of juicy information about Percy Shelley, about Percy leaving his first wife for Mary. You're not going to get any of that. You also don't get a lot in here about grief that she's going through, such as when she lost a child or when Percy died. She kind of just stops a journal when those things happen and it takes her a little bit and then she starts another journal. I think we think of journals in the modern day as kind of a way to let our feelings out and to just kind of digest what we went through that day. It's kind of a way to write down what happened, where we went, but also really how we were feeling about it. The journals of the Regency period are so clinical compared to that. Most of the time, Mary Shelley is just writing what she read that day or went here with so-and-so. It's normally one or two sentences per day. And so you may think, well, gee, what am I even going to get out of this reading experience? But to me, it's still very revealing about her. This is maybe a suggestion for someone who becomes obsessed with Mary like me. I feel like once you get into her, you want to know everything. You want to know everything possible. And the journals are kind of the last step on that journey to me. They're not that interesting on their own. But it's been fabulous over the past couple of years to flip through and see what she was doing on the day 200 years ago. This edition in particular, I would say, is of real value to you if you just in general like the Shelleys. Percy also wrote these journals with her, especially this first journal they kept together. And so at the back of this edition, they have a reading list of what the Shelleys were reading. That to me was basically worth the price of admission. That's really why I wanted this edition is I wanted to know the books that they were reading. But this has her doodles in it. It has some of her discussing what she's thinking about Frankenstein. I will say the parts where Percy interjects, they're really more interesting just because he is so much more long-winded than she is. She is really just interested in recording what happened that day, but Percy Shelley liked to wax poetic, and so his entries are a little bit longer. And I personally think they're really interesting. I think it's interesting just in general, the concept of keeping a journal with your significant other. I think that's really, really fascinating, especially to great minds like the Shelleys. So to me, I think this is a great recommendation. It's definitely one of the best primary sources. There are other journals that were kept by members of her friend circle, especially all of the people who were there in Switzerland when she was coming up with the idea of Frankenstein. So her stepsister Claire kept journals. Uh, Dr. John Polidori, who wrote The Vampire, he also kept a journal and so if you get interested in journals there are so many more from that time period and frankly Polidori's is the juiciest of the three he really gets mad and he uses his journal as a place to like get out emotion which i think is more relatable to the modern day but this is definitely a great resource if you really love mary now of course i have to recommend one of my favorite books of all time, possibly just in general, my favorite nonfiction I have ever read, which is really the reason why I'm obsessed with Mary to this day. That is Romantic Outlaws by Charlotte Gordon. This is a masterclass and it should have won the Pulitzer. This is a dual biography of Mary and her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, who was an early feminist thinker. And so this biography alternates chapters. One chapter is about Mary Wollstonecraft, one chapter is about Mary Shelley. Mary Wollstonecraft died about 10 days after giving birth to Mary Shelley. And so they didn't actually even have a relationship with one another, but Mary Wollstonecraft's writing and ideas that really impacted Mary Shelley and her way of thinking. And this is an interesting biography because everyone I have seen review it clearly connected to one of the Marys and not the other. And I think most people who read this biography connect to Mary Wollstonecraft, her mother. And yet for me, it was night and day. It was so clearly Mary Shelley's show. I couldn't even think about Mary Wollstonecraft. And you might think with a dual biography that you would be clearly more interested in one person than another. And even though I felt like I was far more interested in Mary Shelley than Mary Wollstonecraft, 
I was always really interested to get back to her chapters. I think this is a really interesting case in terms of a dual biography where you are really, really fascinated by both of the figures and you aren't bored or dreading going back to another chapter, going back to the chapters about someone else. Whereas I've read dual biographies or multiple biographies in the past where you just genuinely were only reading for one person. And I feel like Romantic Outlaws is the rare exception to that. The writing here is absolutely incredible and you get invested in this, to me, in a similar way to a fiction book. I'll tell you, I stayed up until one o'clock in the morning reading this and I have never had that experience with another nonfiction book before or since. And I shed a tear when this book was over because I felt like I had lost a friend when Mary Shelley died at the end of the book. This is a masterclass to me. It is fantastic. Everyone should read this. Even if you aren't interested in Mary Shelley or you think you aren't, I promise you that you are. And you're also going to be very interested in Mary Wollstonecraft. I think this is an interesting woman's history and I think it's fascinating to kind of look at the idea of early feminism. I think it's great to read as a woman because Mary Wollstonecraft was so instrumental uh, in certain things, but Mary Shelley is the standout to me. She is just a star. We talk a lot on BookTube about life-changing books. This book truly did change my life because it made me the Mary Shelley stand that I am today. I love her to death and it's all because of this book. So this is my highest recommendation in this video. Please read this. But again, the caveat is we're doing a Mary Shelley video, but half of this book is about Mary Wollstonecraft. I promise you, you'll still be interested in her. In terms of a singular biography of Mary Shelley, we have Fiona Sampson's. This is also a recent publication. What's so great is that so many of the books written on the romantics have actually come out in the past few years, specifically about Mary Shelley as we reached the bicentennial of the publication of Frankenstein. And so that's kind of why Fiona Sampson was writing this. And this in many ways features the writing of Frankenstein as kind of the most important point of Mary's life. And in many ways, I guess you can say that it is because really without Frankenstein, would we be sitting here today having this conversation? I don't actually know that we would be because I think without Frankenstein, the poetry of her peers would probably stand a little bit higher in public consciousness than it does now. But Frankenstein was so instrumental and impactful on modern pop culture that she has kind of outpaced everyone that she was running with at the time, which I think is fascinating and probably would have been remarkable and unheard of to them at the time because Frankenstein was not a bestseller right off the bat. But I do appreciate that Fiona Sampson kind of broadens her view and widens her lens a little bit and looks at the entirety of Mary's life because so much happened post Frankenstein that's really interesting. I have watched a lot of interviews and heard a lot of podcasts with Fiona Sampson, similar to Charlotte Gordon, and I really, really appreciate the things that Fiona Sampson has to say about Mary in the public eye. I just think she's a fascinating historian and I really enjoy hearing her talk about Mary. To me, she's better in these interviews in podcast form. She's a little bit more on form to me in public speaking than she is in prose. I also think this biography is a little bit short. I think it could use a little bit more meat, but I really appreciate this. And this is actually other than Romantic Outlaws, and maybe we can't even count that since that was a dual biography. This is the only single biography of Mary that I have read, and I just wanted a little bit more from it, which again, I'm going to say, I feel is kind of understandable because there was so much that happened in her life and there's so much that was really, really interesting. So I guess I just wanted more detail given, but I think this is a great beginner's book. I think this or Romantic Outlaws kind of eases you into not only Mary's life, but the time period of the Romantics and the Regency. And that's one of the great things about Romantic Outlaws tying in the story of Mary Wollstonecraft. Most good nonfiction on Mary will talk about her mother because there's so much that Mary Wollstonecraft experienced and saw that is actually really instrumental socially during the time period in which Mary Shelley is coming of age, talking about the impact of the French Revolution and also in general, the impact of Napoleon. So I actually think it's really important to have the context of her mother 
alongside Mary, and Fiona Sampson delves into that too. I just think this book was a little bit short. That's the main critique of it that I have, but it was still really, really good. And I think this is the most recent publication of those that I would recommend. So this is definitely more up to date than some others. Last but not least, I wanted to recommend Young Romantics by Daisy Hay. This is a book that is not exclusively about Mary. This is looking more broadly at the circle of the romantic poets. So this includes Percy, Lord Byron, Keats, and some of their publishers. This book also gives quite a bit of page time to Claire, who is Mary's stepsister. And to me, that's really why I would recommend this, because I think Claire is an important piece of the puzzle that a lot of people ignore. And that's one of the only critiques I have of Romantic Outlaws is how poorly Claire comes off in it. Claire is an interesting figure that we could talk about at length because she really is never given anything in the way of positive publicity. Most people don't really like her and they look at her as kind of a hanger on, but she is a key player in Mary's life up until the moment of Mary's death. So like it or not, Claire is kind of a big deal. Claire kind of has a lot to do with Mary. So I really liked this book. I read this immediately on the heels of Romantic Outlaws, and it was so interesting how quickly my opinion changed on Claire, and also how quickly my opinion changed on some of the other Romantic poets, which I think is interesting to think about when you were thinking about Mary Shelley and her obviously complex and complicated relationship not just with Percy, but with others like Lord Byron. Romantic Outlaws made you fall in love with Percy at right about the same time that Mary did. And I've never fallen out of love. I love Percy Shelley. And I'll die on this hill. I really do love him. But I think Young Romantics offers a far more nuanced and actually more critical view of him and of the other Romantic poets. To me, this book is really interesting. I think it's a great look into the time period if you have never read anything about the Romantics. And as an aside, I think when you go into nonfiction about literary figures, the question is, should you have read their work? I don't necessarily feel like you need to have read any of the romantic poetry to really get invested in the nonfiction, but I do think to get anything out of a Mary biography, you need to have read Frankenstein because Mary very famously revised Frankenstein. There is an 1818 and 1831 edition of the text. She revised the text after Percy's death. And so there are many differences between the two. And a lot of these nonfiction books talk about that at length, including Young Romantics. So if you've never read Frankenstein, you're definitely going to be spoiled for it. But I don't necessarily think you need to be all that familiar with the works of the others in order to enjoy this nonfiction. So this might be cheating a little bit. Young Romantics is not necessarily all about Mary, but it is about the young romantic circle that she was with. And this is one of those time periods, and Mary is one of those people, in my opinion, that you can't really understand without looking with a wider lens at what was going on. And so I actually think it's really beneficial and it's great to know a little bit of something about Byron, Shelley, Keats, to understand her and kind of how she is working and what she's interested in writing about because there are broader topics and themes that the romantics are interested in discussing and those themes and topics kind of tie all of their work together in a really brilliant way. But again, I think this is a great beginner's book. I actually think all three of the modern nonfictions that I mentioned you could start with. I think these are great introductory books to Mary Shelley but also to the time period. My favorite of course though is Romantic Outlaws. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I would love to know your Mary Shelley nonfiction recommendations down below. I would love to know if you have read any of these, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.